And uh, anyhow, that it's good to have another song written, especially one that reflects the the cost of having for us to have a Bible in our language, uh, an accurate, reliable. It, it it was just great to have a Bible in your language. And now we have an accurate, reliable Bible in our language through uh, through what men have gone through in the past. Sunday school hour, Philippians chapter three. We had a study last week that I would have called the negative part of the study. I didn't turn it on yet. It is on. I'm on. Are you on? Okay. Anyhow, that last week we looked at these verses, and we we first last the previous week uh, before last week looked at looked at the same verses from a positive aspect. Then we looked at them from the negative aspect that Paul's given a warning about, and then we look beyond that into verse 20 today. But let let me read to you verses 17 through 21. And verse 20 and the first part of verse 21 is what we're going to be focusing in on this morning. It says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and tell you now even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it might be fa- may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Let's pray. Father, I do pray that we'll look at this passage of Scripture today and see all that's being told us as... Uh, as a, a warning and, a, and also as an example of, of how we ought to walk and as well as it reveals to us what your intent and purpose for us is. So we pray that we'll be, uh, pay close attention to the passage that we might glean everything that you would have us to glean, the doctrine, the reproof, the correction, the instruction in righteousness. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. The the Apostle Paul gave that warning, uh, actually he is positive in verse 17 when he says, Be ye followers together of me. Then he warns them, to, uh, not warns, he tells them to mark those that walk so, that is to walk like the Apostle Paul walks. He gave a negative in verses 18 and 19 of those who do not like walk like the Apostle Paul does and ultimately calls them the uh, enemies of the cross of Christ and describes the fact that their end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, and then concludes with, who mind earthly things. He concluded that way because as he picks up again in verse 20, talking about be a follower of him and mark those who walk like Paul does in the positive, rather than people who mind earthly things, he says in verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven. From hence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's not like those who, who's, who are enemies of the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ has effected a means today by which God is going to reconcile the heavens. By the time we're done with this, this section of verses, verses 20 and 21, that you're going to see not only how our walk on earth ought to be, be under, you'll understand why it ought to be because of what God's purpose is in the heavens. And so... Um, The cross of Christ has been the means by which God today in His grace could form the body of Christ for the heavenly places and for someone to come along and take the cross of Christ and apply it in a way that God does not intend it to apply today. They are enemies of the cross of Christ and ultimately they mind earthly things. They're not minding the things that God has revealed from heaven for us concerning the heavens. And and that's why we want to look today in verse 20 when it says, For our conversation is in heaven. Uh, that's a passage, that's a verse of scripture, a statement there, uh, that I often have quoted the, uh, in another way, uh, so often that I thought the King James Bible said, our citizenship is in heaven. Almost, uh, almost any time this verse is quoted, it's a quote that, that people will say, they'll quote verse 20 and they'll actually say it. Uh, when I say people, I, I'm talking about even people that all the other translations will say, our citizenship is in heaven. The King James says, our conversation is in heaven. But it, it's, it's so set, set in heaven that even people who, like, like myself, would consider myself King James, I will quote sometimes, our conversation is in heaven. It just comes right out. I've heard it quoted that, that way so many times. 
it's not really, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that when you look at the context, it doesn't take you too far out of the context. It's not too wrong to say it that way, but that's not what the verse says. It just said that way in other translations and, and, and other people. It's actually a verse that years ago, if someone would say, and, and, and it needs to be challenged, why is it that you think you're going to heaven? Why do you think heaven is your home? Well, it says in Philippians, our, our citizenship is in heaven. And, and you quote it like, like it says that, and it, 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 there's an implication about us in heaven in the verse, but it says our conversation is in heaven. And, and the point is, is, I used to use it as a proof text. Here's one verse that's really clear that God's purpose for us today is heaven because our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, and there's, there's a reason that people translate it that way, uh, but it's not really the proof text of that. In fact, when you read your Bible, it's Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians that solidify. Now, you even get it in Corinthians, both in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, that God's purpose for the body of Christ centers in the heavens. Even that strange verse in 1 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul in chapter 6 is talking to the Corinthians about not taking each other to court, and he says, Note you know, we shall judge the angels. And so often we always... Uh, people agree with me when I say this. Until I read that in the verse, I would have said, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> Paul says it like, don't you know? And if he didn't write that, I would have never known. But from that verse, we realize God's purpose for us involves angelic beings. You know, God's purpose for us involves the heavens. That's why there is a rapture of the church, the body of Christ. Uh, and, and what most people really don't understand is that before you come to the Apostle Paul in your Bible, no one ever expected to go to heaven. Now, it, Peter never spent a day in his life thinking about going to heaven. They asked the Lord, what's the sign of your coming in the end of the world? And it's going to end where Jesus Christ is going to come back to earth to them and set up his kingdom there. Even the verse that, that people quote out of uh, John chapter 14, he says uh, that he's going to go away. And then he, he makes the statement that, uh, 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 that I will come... Uh, I didn't even want to go there. <laughs> uh, but, Say it louder, Leon, I can hear you then. No. What is it? <laughs> if I just get started. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, so that's the one everyone thinks, okay, we're going to go to heaven because he's going to heaven to prepare a place. But if you look at the verse, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, where well, he's back on earth, there you may be also. And Jesus Christ is going to prepare a place for them in his kingdom, and he's going to come back and establish that kingdom here on earth. That's why they prayed, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. God promised Abraham that land and, and to him and to his seed after him as an everlasting possession. So where are they going to spend eternal life? In the, in the land promised Abraham here on earth. Heaven is a place that you start reading about in Paul's epistles because God had a secret purpose for mankind that wasn't revealed until the age of grace. A purpose that you and I are involved in today that, that is God's purpose for the heavens. And so for someone to come along today and, and, and be heavenly minded, preach heaven, or be earthly minded and preach earthly things, it's contrary to what God is accomplishing in the age of grace. So Paul says, our conversation is in heaven. Let's talk a little bit about that conversation in, is in heaven. Um, it's actually a Greek word that they, they fight over because it's only, translate, it's only found here in this passage. That it's so close to other, verse, other words in the Bible that you can uh, get the definition from those other words. But the Greek word is something like to the effect of uh, uh, polytoma almost sounds like politics, polytoma, and so you can see where maybe they would get the idea of citizenship. Um, but it's real close to the same word that already was here in Philippians. Look back to chapter 1 and verse 27, which is a theme of, of this book, uh, what Paul challenging the Philippian saints. He said, only, Philippians 1, 27, only let your conversation, so it's translated conversation there again, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, in one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So the, the verse starts out talking about only let your conversation become at, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. 
So conversation, as it's used in the King James, is not just a word like, let's sit down and talk. Conversation expresses what your life is all about. And, and Paul's telling them, only let your conversation, your life, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I'm absent, uh, here or absent, I may hear of your affairs. See, the conversation is their affairs of life. That ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind. So here is a group of people that their conversation is only the gospel of Christ. The, the purpose for their existence and their fellowship centers around getting the gospel of Christ out so that with one mind and one spirit, they strive together for the faith of the gospel. That their, their life together, the things that you express and live for in life, is the gospel. Well, Paul, when he says over there in Philippians chapter 3, for our conversation is in heaven, he's making that, that statement there that the, the, the intent and the purpose of his life centers around heaven. And, 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 and as we know that we're going to go to heaven, some people, when they look at that, translate it citizenship. But if you would say our citizenship, then the verse would only be saying that our final destination is heaven. But if you understand that what verse 20 is saying, it's coming out of verse 17, where verse 17, now take the parentheses out, you go from 17 to 21, it says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as you have us for an example, for our conversation is in heaven. Paul's not talking about his final destination is in heaven. He's talking about his walk here in this earth is centered in heaven. It's all focused in on its purpose of, its intent, the things that he's conducting, he's doing in this life, just like our conversation in this life is, is the gospel. His conversation in this life is heaven. It's all centered around heaven. And ultimately, heaven will be the final destination. But, but Paul uses another word. This is an interesting. Come, come to uh, Acts chapter 23. I don't want to give you a word study. I, in fact, I'm really not capable of word studies. I can see how these words are used, and I realize that like, conversation in the King James doesn't just mean to talk. It means to live. What you're living for, what you're about. And, uh, and, and that's what I, I said before. What you do, speak so loud, I can't hear what you say. I mean, you can say anything about yourself, but your life's going to declare what it's all about. And, uh, and, and that's what the word conversation in its essence means. And, and, uh, and so Paul's using it that way, and, or we have it that way in our King James Bible. A word that's, that's from the same Greek word, not exactly the same, but very close, is when the Apostle Paul is defending himself in Acts chapter 23, in verse 1. It says, And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have, now see this word, lived, that's real close to what he's saying, that, that same Greek word that, that is translated conversation. I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. I'm talking about his life. But, and what his life portrays. Good conscience before God. That the, the way he has conducted himself in life does not, before God does not condemn him. So you're realizing that when you talk about conversation, you're talking about the way you live and what you live for. And, and it represents you. And, and, and so sometimes they use a synonym such as citizenship. But th there's another term that, that is used in the Bible that's, that's a real help. Come over to Ephesians chapter 2. Paul conducted himself away in such a way, not only before God, but men could see what he was all about. That's why he, he's defending himself that way, before God and man. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul talks about us, us Gentiles before this age of grace, when God, before God raised up the Apostle Paul and sent him to us Gentiles, he always has us remember that what God was accomplishing and before left, was accomplishing left us out. Now, look what God was accomplishing before this age of grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. He says, Remem Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are uncircumcised, by, who are called uncircumcised, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Now, God gave a physical circumcision to the nation of Israel. They're his physical people for this physical planet Earth. 
At that time, us Gentiles, we were called Gentiles, that's a term of uncleanness. That's why we're uncircumcised. It's a term that would refer to dogs. So, and, and we were called that way because, not only were we called that, but verse 12 says that at that time ye were without Christ. God had departed from the Gentiles. Jesus Christ was sent to the nation of Israel. God, the nation of Israel, God was their God and they were God's people. So we were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. See that word commonwealth? That's real close to that word over there that's conversation that some want to call citizenship. And, and it, it's really kind of a, a neat word when you think about it. Well, the commonwealth of Israel. Israel had a commonwealth, something they shared together. Commonwealth is, is used sometimes, you get the political term out of that. Because if you ever watch like when, when they're passing the electoral votes for the president or if they're doing, making some kind of law and each representative of each state stands up and makes a statement and they always got to make a proudful remark before they cast their vote, they'll stand up, uh, the great state, uh, the great commonwealth of Virginia would cast their vote for and then, then they make a statement. But there, there's certain states, they call themselves commonwealth. And what that means is the people that are in that territory share things in common together. That's a commonwealth that they share. And Israel had a commonwealth. That is, they were politically God's people. All other nations were not God's people. And, and so at that time we were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Things changed. The age of grace is different. But don't forget, it wasn't always like it is today. There was a time God wasn't dealing with us Gentiles. But now that God has formed the church, the body of Christ, I'm going to read verse 14 with that. It says, for he, for he is our peace who hath made both one and broken down the middle wall of petition between us. Verse 15 ends by saying, uh, having create, made in himself of the twain one new man, that he might reconcile both. God took Jew and Gentile, reconciled them together in one body called the one new man, the body of Christ. The reason I emphasize that, this one new man, the body of Christ, we have a commonwealth. Our citizenship or our conversation is in heaven. And conversation really covers it more than just, if you say citizenship, your, your idea is your la final destination. Paul's not expressing his final destination. He's talking about his, the commonwealth that he shares with the body of Christ here on earth is all focused. The purpose of it all is in the heavens. And the reason he's doing that, come over to chapter 6 of Ephesians. What Paul is expressing by that term, our conversation is in heaven, is that our lives here on earth we are here as an ambassador of heaven. He says in Ephesians chapter 6, when he talks about this age of grace, and he, in Ephesians 6, he's in jail, and as he's talking about praying, he says, pray for all the saints, and then he's, in verse 19, he, he includes himself. Verse 19 of Ephesians 6 says, And for me, that utterance may get, be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds. At that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, by the way, the gospel is not a mystery. When Paul gives the gospel, he says that, that the, what he delivered to the Corinthians is what he also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for sin was not a mystery. It was, the scripture said that a Messiah was going to come, he was going to bear the sins of many, he's going to die on the cross, that God would not leave his soul in hell, that God would raise him from the dead, his flesh would not see corruption. All those are prophecies about Jesus Christ, written aforetime, and even the fact that he was going to pay for sin. A little obscure exactly how that, that his payment was the propitiation of all sins, but it was there in type and it was there in prophecy. What was revealed to Paul as an ambassador is what he, Paul calls the mystery of the gospel. The, the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, be, provided the means by which God in His grace 
could postpone his dealings with Israel, turn to us Gentiles, form the body of Christ for a secret purpose that no one ever knew before until it was revealed to the Apostle Paul. Hence, Paul calls it the mystery of the gospel. The gospel provided salvation. The mystery of the gospel is the, me, the purpose by, for which God created the body of Christ today. And that purpose involves the heavens. So Paul says in this verse 21, For which I am an ambassador in bonds, wherein, to, where, wherein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The mystery of the gospel, Paul looks at his life here on earth as an ambassador in bonds, in jail. They took the ambassador of peace, a message of reconciliation, and they put him in jail for preaching this message. So he's an ambassador in bonds. But Paul looked at his life. His conversation is in heaven because he looked at himself as, I'm just here, I, I don't mind earthly things because I don't belong to this earth. Not only do, does that mean I belong to God, it means I'm part of God's heavenly calling. The high calling of God that's in Christ Jesus. Paul knew that the purpose of the body of Christ is in heaven, and therefore when he walked this earth, even in this walk, his conversation is in heaven because he's here as an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Now that someone is in tune not just with the fact that he was saved, but why God saved him. Where his life centered at. You know the verse in Colossians, we'll probably be looking at it in a moment, but it says, when Christ who is our life shall appear. And he's going to appear in glory. He's going to appear in heaven. He's going to call us home to heaven. Paul understood that, that the things that go on here, the, these are just Satan working in the world, but we're not part of this world system, that God's salvation in the age of grace is focused in on the heavens. You know, as an ambassador, an ambassador is not someone that comes and, and thinks that he's going to live in that country forever. If we send an ambassador to another country, that ambassador don't go there and say, oh, I've got to get part of their retirement plan and I've got to get myself a permanent home because I want to retire over here by the lake that's over here. Uh, an ambassador, he don't come in and just make himself at home as if he's going to live there forever. He realizes I'm on temporary assignment and my assignment isn't just to make myself one of these people, but I'm here to represent my homeland. And as a result of representing my homeland, even though these people have customs and, and things they do, I'm not here to insult them, but I'm not here to be part of their customs either. I'm not here to live like them, look like them, act like them. I'm here to look and act different than them because I represent the country I'm from. That's why Paul's saying our conversation is in heaven. It's not only our final destination. It, we're down here and, as representatives of heaven, as ambassadors of heaven. You know, when you get that understanding, especially if you're young, you're, you need to get that understanding real clear that you're saved for a purpose and now you represent God's heavenly calling, God's purpose for the heavens. You represent what heaven would want people to know here on earth. When you do that, there's a passage, I'll just read it to you because I don't want to go through the whole thing, but in Luke chapter 15, there is the story about the prodigal son. Now, it's a story about where, where a man who, in Israel's program, would have an inheritance here on earth. The two sons, the one son pleased the father. The other son said, Father, give me my inheritance and let me go. I just want to go live in the world. And I don't want to wait till you die to get my inheritance. So the father gives him his inheritance and, and the, the one son goes off and rather represent what his father should, would want him to represent Instead of representing the family name and the family inheritance, he went and squandered his inheritance. He lived like the world. And there's a statement made about him that just kind of fits when we talk about us being ambassador from heaven. When he went to live in the world, he ended up broke. He spent all of his inheritance. So then he had to get a job, and, and, and Luke 15, 15 says this, And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into the fields to feed swine. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He's not part of that country. But he, he joined that. And, and a Jew, they don't do anything with swine. This guy not only was sent out to feed swine, he ends up eating the swine's food. He got so hungry because he squandered, squandered his inheritance. Now, our inheritance is heaven. We're not part of the Jewish inheritance. But we don't need to join ourselves to the citizenship of this country. And I'm not talking about not being Americans. I'm talking about us 
not becoming earthly minded that this is our life is here and we're so planted here that we forget that we're only here on temporary assignment we represent God's purpose for the heavens and so we don't need to join and go feed the swine <laughs> we need to stay separate from all of that so that, that's what Paul's expressing when he says for our conversation is in heaven in fact I'll tell you what if you, you, you got Philippians 3 right get Ephesians just Ephesians chapter 1 and in Colossians chapter 1 I want to just point out to you when I say that Paul speaks about heaven I want you to see these places and if you, they're all Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians they're all right there together but it's our purpose of life it's to be our focus of life the heavens because what Paul says in Philippians 3 there after he says our conversation is in heaven he says from whence also we look for the Savior he, he, he's living walking here looking for the Savior from heaven the reason he's looking for the Savior from heaven we're gonna be called into the heavens when the Savior shall appear but but when he does that it, it, he's talking about his very focus of life is to is to look heavenward the testimony of his life is heaven Ephesians chapter 3 just look at these verses verse 1 no, Ephesians 1 verse 3 says blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ our blessings are in heavenly places in Christ verse 11 I'll, I'll let you study the passage but in chapter 1 of Ephesians verse 11 says in whom in Christ also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him that worketh all things after the counsel of his own will well, if Israel is going to inherit the land promised to Abraham and the meek are going to inherit the earth, what is our inheritance? Well, when you read in Ephesians, our inheritance has nothing to do with the earth. It has to do with the heavens. We have an inheritance in the heavens. You'll see that even in these other verses that we're going to look at. Verse 18, Paul says that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you might know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints now that's God inheriting and us having a hope of our calling which when you look down through the passage centers around Jesus Christ exalted in the heavens so the hope of our calling is in the heavens there's several other verses that would describe that but Ephesians chapter 6 uh, 2 and verse 6 says and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ so that we are seated in Christ in heavenly places and when you get to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 it says put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against the powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places the high calling of God that's in Christ Jesus the, high, the, the spiritual wickedness in high places is we're battling our warfare is in the heavens against Satan and his angels from the heavens um, and, and that affects our life come over to Colossians chapter 3 it says in verse 1 if ye then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God I've told you already not only seek those things that are above he tells you where above heaven's a big place so not only you seek those things that are above but seek those things that are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God we're seated with Christ in heavenly places the reign of Christ in heaven that's the things we're focused on and, and, and our life is to be set on our affections that are to be set upon verse 2 set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth why for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God when Christ who is our life shall appear then shall ye also appear with him in glory your life hid in Christ in God what God has for you what your life is all about is hid right now you can study it in scripture and know what it's about other people can't see it unless you live the way so they can see it but it's all centered in Christ and when he appears then it's gonna appear for you as well then shall ye appear with him in glory 
So that's why we're looking for that. You'll, you'll see that connection in Philippians there. Uh, before we go back to Philippians, come back to chapter Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 5, just the introduction to the book. Chapter, cha Colossians 1, verse 5. It says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye have heard in the word of the truth of the gospel. Our hope is in heaven. And, and so everything about our, our blessings are there, our inheritance is there, our calling is there, our seating is there, our warfare is there, our affections ought to be there, our life is hid with Christ in God in those heavens, and that's why we're waiting for him to appear in heaven. Our, uh, our hope is in heaven, and uh, it, later, it, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1 says, If this earthly house of this tabernacle, tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Everything centered in the heavens. So therefore, Paul's focus of life is, is centered in heaven. That's Philippians chapter 3. Now, Philippians chapter 3, Paul says, verse 20, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so it's our conversation is there, and we're looking for Christ to come from there because the, our whole life is centered, is hid with Christ in God. And when he appears, then we're going to appear with him in glory. So that's the ultimate. When Jesus Christ appears, we're going to be raptured up into that purpose that God has for us. E even when you talk about rapture, you know, we realize the word rapture don't appear in the Bible. But instead, it, it, the word rapture comes from the Greek word caught up. Why are we caught up? Why are we meet the Lord in the air? Why does it say, so shall we ever be with the Lord? Because God's purpose for us is the heavens. The, he don't have to catch up the people that he's coming down to, to raise from the dead. So we're, we're looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I, I'm not sure when it was. It probably was back up in verse 13 and 14 when we were talking about our high calling of God. In fact, that's, uh, I was kept emphasizing the high calling of God is not just a calling from heaven, but it's a calling to the heavens. That when Paul says, from whence we look for the Savior, we're looking for the Savior to appear. Uh, Titus chapter uh, 2 and verse 13 says, looking for... That blessed hope, our hope is a heaven, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That we're looking for Jesus Christ to appear because at looking at for him to appear is the time in which we're going to be raptured out in the heavens. So Paul says, looking from whence also we look for the Savior. He's focused in on that in life, looking for that. Now, when he's focusing on life and looking for that, that's how he's going to fulfill what it says in 2 Timothy 4, that there's a crown of righteousness not only for Paul, but for all those who love his appearing. They're looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ. And, and when we talked about this before, uh, I, I don't know if you recall this, but in, in Luke chapter 1, uh, no, chap, no, Luke chapter 21, it, it actually starts out in Acts chapter 1, the 12 apostles, when Jesus Christ left them, now, this is, the, this is the passage that you know Jesus Christ in his second coming is going to touch the earth. Zechariah says, his feet shall stand upon the Mount of Olives. He left from the Mount of Olives. The apostles watch him ascend into heaven, where from whence he, uh, he ascended into heaven, and then caught up in a cloud. Interesting, we're going to meet him up in the clouds. Anyhow, they watch him ascend into heaven in a cloud, and an angel said, why stand ye gazing into heaven? They had a job to do. Don't stand here looking at heaven. Go do your job. When you come to Luke chapter 21, that's the passage they ask the Lord, well, what's the sign of your coming in the end of the world? And he starts talking about how Jerusalem is going to be compassed about with an army and all these signs. He said there'll be signs in heaven above and the earth beneath. And he says, when you see these signs begin to happen, look up. It actually said, then look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. So they're not to walk around looking into heaven. They're to be looking in the world for signs to take place. And when they see those signs, then they're to look up for Jesus Christ's return all the way back to the earth. Paul doesn't ever use language like that. One of the things that makes the rapture different, the catching up, and at a different time and event than the second coming of Jesus Christ to the earth, is the fact that the Apostle Paul never teaches us 
to be looking for signs. We're not to look for the signs of the time because we're not the people of the signs. <laughs> the signs were given to the nation of Israel and there were signs of things that are going to take place on earth. We are looking for the Savior Himself. We're to be looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to return because when He comes back, look at that verse again, it says, For our conversation is, a, is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now, if you need to be, naturally we're not going to deal with all of verse 21 right now, but you need to be focused in on where Paul's going with this. Our conversation is in heaven. We're looking for the Savior from heaven. And he's making these statements because when Jesus Christ appears, a glorious event is about to take place. But then that, that's not the end of it. That glorious event is going to take place because God is going to bring to fruition a purpose that he kept secret from the foundation of the world. And that's still not the end of it. It's the third thing about that, it's a purpose that God has centered in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's important to know. We're a part of something. So we're looking for some glorious event, that, that's going to involve you. But it's a glorious event, that, uh, event that's going to fulfill a purpose of God. A glorious event that's going to glorify God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you only look at the rapture, then you're just selfishly looking for yourself. If you look beyond that and say, I have a place in God's plan, what is God's plan? Then you're focused in on what God is accomplishing. And then if you see what God is accomplishing, you'll see it's all centered in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the verse again now. Who shall change our vile body. Something's going to happen to you. A glorious event's about to take place. That it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body. That's, that's a fabulous study right there by itself. But it's going to happen for a reason. According to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. God is going to subdue all things. It's going to happen because God has a plan to subdue all things. The word all things in there will, will incorporate God's total plan for the body of Christ and the nation of Israel. And that total plan of God, as you'll see, centers in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the fullness of Him that filleth all in all, the Bible says. Now, so we, we got some things to study and don't have too much time to study them here, but one thing I'll just close with for today is when it says, who shall change our vile body? How close are you sitting to somebody right now? If our bodies are vile, you might want to scoot over a little bit. <laughs> You know, the Bible don't say a whole lot about the body, good about the bodies we live in today. Amen. A vile body. Romans chapter 6 calls it the body of sin. It's what houses your old nature. It's what's prone to sin. It wants to dictate your life. It wants to control your life. That's why you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that it don't. But a vile body, God's going to change our vile bodies. There's a time you're not going to have a vile body. We'll talk about a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. But what we're talking about here is certainly the timing is going to be the rapture. It's going to take place at the rapture. But what's going to take place is a resurrection and a change in, in the body that you have. For the purpose of God subduing all things unto himself. And the, vi the body that you have now is vile. It's sinful. You need to be saved from your sins. When I say it's an event that's going to take place, it's going to take place for those who have come to recognize their need of the Savior. Who's recognized that I can't just wash, baptize this body and think that God's going to receive it. God's never going to receive this body. Amen. You can clean it up. You can paint it up. You can even try to make it walk right. And, and try not to do wrong in this vile body. But this vile body, it's a vile body before God. It's a body of sin. You can be saved from your sins by believing that Jesus Christ took on a body that did not come from Adam. 
that he, he has humanity through a virgin, but he's God manifested in the flesh. He didn't have a vile body. And never did a vile thing in his life. And he went to the cross and died a cruel death on the cross because in his body, in his own body, he bore our sins upon that tree, the Bible says. He died for our sins. Paid for the sins that we've done in the flesh. And even of the mind and of the soul. Paid for our sins, put away sin by the sacrifice in himself, and rose again for our justification so that we could be declared righteous before a holy God. And the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're saved that very moment from all your sins. So then when God is going to take you for his eternal purpose... You're going to change that vile body. You're not going to go with this vile body. You're going to be changed. If you're dead, you know the vile body is already going to have to go through a transformation. But if you're alive when Jesus Christ back, comes back, your body is going to go through a dramatic transformation. The Bible describes well, what happened to it, what it will be transformed into, but it won't be a vile body anymore. It will be a body that's going to serve him in the heavens. That's why Paul says our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies, that it might be fashioned unto His glorious body, because God has got a purpose to subdue all things unto Himself, and you can be a part of that purpose. And it all starts out with you just trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're not only saved from your sins, you're not only saved from going to hell, you become a part of God's eternal purpose in the heavens. And it's all to glorify and exalt His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I pray that each person here would realize that they cannot work their way into heaven by their good deeds because they're working in a body that's vile and sinful. That Father, we can be saved because of the body that Jesus Christ took on and the blood that he shed on the cross for our sins and that through him we can be saved and have everlasting life and look forward to this glorious event. But even before that event, Father, I pray that each one of us would realize what our life here on earth is all about. It's about your eternal purpose for us. And so may we live as our conversation is in heaven, looking for the Savior. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In closing, turn to page 294 in your hymnals. We're going to sing the third verse. Oh.